As I was saying, the lakefront in Chicago is amazing. There's a public park that stretches the entire length of the city all along Lake Michigan. And you can go out there in the summertime and swim and picnic. You have amazing views of all of the architecture. It's just a beautiful spot. I used to ride my bike up and down that whole thing, dozens and dozens of miles in the freezing snow, 10 degrees below in the winter, in the raging hot 105 degree muggy weather. I mean, you can feel it at the most innermost core of your body. It makes you feel alive. Just like calculus, just like our understanding of the infinite. Let's compute some more derivatives. Let's take the derivative of minus four y to the fifth theta to the y plus seven cosine of y cotangent of y. Now we don't usually think of the input variable for a function as y, right? Usually x is the input, y is the output. But I just wanna point out that, I mean, these are arbitrary choices. We're certainly allowed to think of a function of y and to take the derivative with respect to y. Nothing wrong with that. As long as the derivative operator says we're taking it with respect to y, as long as it's d by dy, then that's perfectly reasonable. That's allowed. Okay, it's a sum of two functions. Sums play nicely with derivatives, so we just need to take the derivative of each piece. And so analyzing the first piece, the constant comes out, and then we'll take the derivative of y to the fifth times e to the y using the product rule. So I better put that all in parentheses here so both terms are getting multiplied by that minus four. Here's the product rule. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Like so. So that's the derivative of minus four y to the fifth times z to the y. Next up, we have seven times the derivative of cosine times cotangent. Now, tell you what, I actually want to put this down on the next line to make sure I have room. Always a good idea to make sure you have room. We have the derivative of the first piece, that's cosine of y, times the second piece, that's cotangent of y, plus the first piece, that's cosine, times the derivative of cotangent. My oh my. All right, so we just applied the product rule twice to this product and to this product. Continuing on, we need to take those derivatives and evaluate. So the derivative of y to the fifth, that's not five to the y, it's not an exponential function. It's just our old friend, the power rule. It's just five y to the fourth. For the second term, y to the fifth is being multiplied by the derivative of e to the y. Uh, that's just e to the y. It doesn't matter if we call it e to the x or e to the y or e to the t, whatever that variable is called, if that's what you're taking the derivative with respect to, it is just itself. Very nice. Okay, next up we have the other piece. And again, I wanna make sure I have room. Derivative of cosine, that's minus sine, and we're multiplying it by cotangent. And then for the second piece, we have cosine and then we need to multiply by the derivative of cotangent. The derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. So there, I've just used the derivative of cotangent. Very good. Now to simplify, I think I'm gonna multiply through by the minus four and then we'll pretty much be done with that piece. I guess we could also factor out a y to the fourth and an e to the y. Hmm. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sure, let's do it that way. So we have y to the fourth, e to the y. That'll be our common term. Here we still have a five, but I'm gonna multiply through by the minus four. I don't know why, I just feel like doing it that way. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, where was I? Uh, y to the fourth, e to the y, that's the common term here. So we have an extra y and that's being multiplied by minus four. So let's write it that way. We don't have to, but it seems reasonable. Well, let's see, is there any cancellation that happens here from trig identities? Cotangent is cosine over sine, right? So if we multiply by sine, the sines are gonna cancel. So that one's gonna turn out pretty nice. Cotangent 
that's cosine divided by sine. So that sine in the numerator is going to cancel with the sine that it's being multiplied by. And we're just left with cosine in that case. So we have minus cosine, that's being multiplied by 7. We got minus 7 cosine of y. I almost wrote x, so used to writing x, but the variable is called y here. Okay, what about for this one? Cosecant is 1 over sine. So I guess we could write one of the cosine over sines as a cotangent. In that case, it would look like cotangent times cosecant. Or we could leave it this way, just in terms of cosine and cosecant. Uh, honestly, I don't really see an advantage either way, so let's just leave it the same. We'll have minus 7 cosine of y times cosecant squared of y. I guess the advantage of writing it this way is that we could factor out this common factor of cosine of y if we wanted to, if the rest of the problem made that advantageous. Meh. Meh. I don't really care. Let's leave it that way. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin, crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Let's take the derivative of 4 times x cubed plus 1 times tangent of x, all divided by 2 minus secant of x times sine of x. Now, why in the world would you want to do such a thing? Well, I'm not really sure. That's the problem as it's presented to us. Remember, we're just practicing our derivative rules. We're just taking more and more complicated functions and learning how to analyze their pieces so that we can take the derivative overall by carefully proceeding step by step. Okay, now, before we proceed with this one, it will be a quotient rule, but there's a little bit of simplification that we can do. Check it out. Secant, that's the same thing as 1 over cosine. So if I multiply secant by sine, I'm taking 1 over cosine times sine. That's the same thing as just tangent, right? Because it's sine over cosine. So that whole term there on the bottom, we can actually rewrite that as tangent. And that's going to save us a little bit of work. It's still going to be a lot of work, but it'll save us some work. Let's do that. The top stays the same. Downstairs we have 2 minus tangent of x. And now uh, you might say, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, I'm going to cancel the tangents. No, you can't cancel the tangent here. That's because of this 2. If the 2 weren't there, if it were just minus tangent of x, I could cancel the tangent from top and bottom. But remember, you need something to be a common factor in both the top and the bottom of a fraction in order to cancel it. It needs to be multiplied by everything in the top and everything in the bottom to cancel it off. So that's the best we can do. Now let's apply the quotient rule. We'll have the derivative of the top. So the derivative of 4 times x cubed plus 1 times tangent of x times the bottom, that's 2 minus tangent of x, minus that all-important minus sign, can't forget that, the top, that's 4x cubed plus 1 times tangent of x, times the derivative of the bottom. Uh, now, I don't want to try to squeeze that in, so I'm going to write it this way to make sure that I have room and that I can stay legible. I want to be able to read what I'm doing to check my work, make sure everything's correct. So again, we have the top times the derivative of the bottom there, applying the quotient rule. Downstairs, we just take what we had, 
and we square it. That's always what you do in the quotient rule. Okay, now we're going to be taking the derivative of this function. Notice that, that itself is a product of two functions. So to take this derivative, I need to use the product rule. I'm going to go ahead and do that directly without writing the intermediate step where I take the uh, use the d by dx notation. I'm just going to go ahead and evaluate directly. All right. So here we have the derivative of the first function. The derivative of this function is just 4 times 3x squared. That's by the power rule, and because the derivative of 1 is 0, so that's the derivative of the first function times the second plus the first function times the derivative of the second. What's the derivative of tangent? It's secant squared. So there, that term in these big parentheses that's this first derivative right there. Okay, so maybe to help you keep track of everything, I can color code this derivative. Just that piece right there corresponds to this using the product rule. Next up, we're going to have 2 minus tangent of x. And that's going to stay the same. 2 minus tangent of x. We're just multiplying that on the right there. Oh my, I'm already out of room in my fraction. So I'm going to go and make myself another line. That's just the same fraction continuing. I have that minus sign from before. So we have the minus 4x cubed plus 1 tangent of x. That term right there, that's the 4x cubed plus 1 tangent of x, no problem. And then next up, we'll be taking the derivative of 2 minus tangent of x. The derivative of 2 minus tangent of x. It's off the screen, oh no. Let me go back and help you out. Remember, this final piece was the derivative of 2 minus tangent of x. We're now going to evaluate that derivative and multiply it by what we have so far. The derivative of 2 is just 0. So we're just taking the derivative of minus tangent of x. Well, that's minus secant squared, because the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And multiplying by uh, minus 1, that minus sign is just multiplying by a constant. It doesn't change the derivative. Oh, man. Whew. OK, we still have the denominator. We need to square 2 minus tangent of x. I get 4 minus 4 tangent of x plus tangent squared of x in the denominator. And then to remind myself that this is part of the same fraction, I'll write something like that. Like, you know, this denominator here is, you know, comes from here, something like that. Oh my, oh my. Hopefully it fits on one line this time. So, what do we get? At this point, we're done taking derivatives. We just need to analyze what we got. So I'm going to foil out these two terms when they multiply. I'll have 12x squared tangent times 2. In other words, I'll have 24x squared tangent of x. And then I'll also have this times 2. So that'll be an 8x cubed plus 1 secant squared of x. All right. I also have the outer term, so that's minus tangent times this. That'll be minus 12x squared tangent squared. And then finally, we have this piece times 2 minus tangent of x. Oh, I told you I would color code, and then I didn't finish. That, that frustrates me. Sorry about that. What happened? We had the derivative of 2 minus tangent of x. That's just minus secant squared of x. Derivative of 2 minus tangent x became minus secant squared. And then I also missed the yellow. The 2 minus tangent of x just stayed around like that. OK, so there you have that previous step in full glory with all the colors. Ah, that feels better. OK. Continuing onward with the algebra we were working on. Well, let's see, where were we? We're foiling this all out. I've multiplied minus tangent by 12x squared tangent of x. 
that's where this came from. I also need to multiply by this term. So I'll have a minus 4 x cubed plus 1 times secant squared tangent. Looks like I'm not going to be able to fit it on this line. So this is a little bit trickier. I don't want to do a word, you know, a break in the page under a multiplication. So tell you what, let's just save that minus 4x cubed plus 1 and bring it down to the next line when we do this other fraction. So again, we have minus 4x cubed plus 1 times secant squared x tangent of x. Whoo-wee! So that was just foiling out these two terms. We still have to deal with those two terms. Uh, there will be a minus minus. Two wrongs make a right. That's a plus 4 times x cubed plus 1 tangent secant squared. Okay, that's the entire numerator. We multiplied everything out. Not so bad. The denominator, I don't really see anything we can do. I'm just going to keep it the same. What kind of simplifications can we do here? The most immediate one is that down here in the second line where we continued the fraction, this term and this term are identical. It's tangent secant squared, tangent secant squared, times 4x cubed plus 1. Here it's with a minus sign, and there it's with a plus sign. Those two terms are going to cancel. That's huge. Canceling those two off is really going to help us out a lot. We'll definitely be able to fit the function on one line now. What else can we do? Notice that x squared tangent of x, x squared tangent squared of x, oh no, I guess they're not the same term. We can't really combine those. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I don't think there's anything else we can do, honestly. We could factor out an x, but notice that because of this plus 1, there's a secant squared term that doesn't have an x. There's no hope of canceling with the bottom, given the form of the function. I think this is just the way it is. OK. 24x squared tangent of x plus 8 times x cubed plus 1 secant squared of x minus 12x squared tangent squared of x all divided by 4 minus 4 tangent of x plus tangent squared of x. That's the derivative. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space. At last, the carbon nucleus. So massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks in intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or one and 40 zeros.